The grim reaper knocked at my door, taking for my pretty quadroon. Oh, my pretty quadroon. My flower that's faded too soon. My heart's like the strings on my banjo. All broke for my pretty opportunities in the church. I've been a Sunday school teacher, primary teacher, MIA teacher, high priest teacher, and uh, elders quorum teacher. I've been in the elders quorum president in the first ward in Ogden. I went to conference one time here in Tropic and Thomas E. McKay was the general authority down to the conference and I was sitting in the conference as calm as a summer breeze and didn't think anything, or didn't think the lightning was going to strike, but it did. Called me up out of the audience, made me a high priest, and set me apart as a high councilman and a state mission president. And uh, I wasn't, I was quite a young man at that time working in the National Forest, and uh, I was high councilman in the Penguin Stake and also high councilman in the New Stake, uh, the realignment of the Escalanta uh, Garfield Stake, where we are now today, the Tropic Ward. But I was made branch president at uh, up Bryce Canyon and out the Grand Canyon for 11 years and stake mission president for 11 years and Zora and Bell and I done quite a bit of missionary work here around our country and got several families. Uh, I got Roy Shakespeare and Wanda Shakespeare through the temple in St. George, Lord Smith and Virginia Smith through the temple and got uh, Charlie Francisco and his wife Vi down to Hennerville through the temple. Done a lot of work with the, some of the CC boys that come and married Mormon girls. Didn't have much luck with them. They pretty well stayed to themselves, all of them. And uh, But I had great enjoyment. Had many spiritual things happen. Uh, I might tell a few while I stayed uh, mission president up to Bryce Canyon. I'd been clapped up eight times to singing on the stage in front of the tourists in the old rec hall there at Bryce Canyon. And we had a young boy, he was a beautiful boy, a young man, and uh, he was from Columbus, Ohio. A very intelligent boy, and he came out there to work in the national parks as pressure help, and I befriended him and become a good friend, and he watched me, and we got him coming to church, and I come out from singing, just sat on a, out on the ground there, out back of the stage at the old rec hall, and he put his arm around me. He said, Herm, how soon can I be baptized into the Mormon church? And I said, just as quick as we can teach you all of the main principle to save an ordinance of the gospel of Jesus Christ and your parents. And he said, do I have to tell my parents? And I said, yes. Well, we got him all ready, and uh, he wanted to be baptized, and I did baptize him. But... First, we called his parents, and they come from Columbus, Ohio, and they were really up in the air, and they, they were going to fight it to the hilt. And so I sat up with him in the lodge after everybody had gone to bed about 4 o'clock in the morning. We talked it over, and uh, 
Finally, they give in to their son's wishes, and we brought him down to Tropic and baptized him. Another time, one of the big wigs in the Union Pacific Railroad uh, sent a girl out to Chicago. I had three lovely young ladies that uh, I made them president of the Young Mutual, Young Ladies Mutual Association in the branch up there. And, and her name was Margaret. And I told these girls, I said, I'm going to let uh, you take this lovely girl from Chicago, Margaret, and uh, there have got to be four of you in one room, and I want you to leave the Book of Mormon and the Improvement Era. We didn't have the Enzyme then. We had the Improvement Era on the bed, and I want you to pray, and uh, if she wants to kneel with you, that's fine. And tell her if she'd like to kneel while you're having your fam evening prayer, family prayer, and morning and night, that's fine. Well, things moved along slowly, and finally Margaret said to him one morning, Can I kneel with you in prayer, and can I pray too? And they said, Yes, we'd love to have you do. And finally they she began to ask questions about the Mormon church and about the Book of Mormon. And of course, these young ladies had been growing up in it all their lives, and and this was a golden question, and they began to work with her. And when her parents found out that she wanted to join the Mormon church, boy, they was up in the air proper. They come clear from Chicago and put up a real stink. But Margaret uh, prevailed and was baptized in the Mormon church here in Tropic, and... Uh, and she went back to Chicago and converted her sweetheart, and they come and went to the Brigham Young University and got their degrees there and become teachers, both of them. And I think uh, the last I knew them is up in the Wasatch Front teaching. And uh, so, so many, many things happened while I was up there. Uh, I sometimes would lecture at nights. And, done a lot of entertaining, singing cowboy songs, and yodeling and whistling and entertaining the tourists. And, and uh, then something very ha uh, sad happened up there. I w would work up there in, in the daytime, in the wintertime, and then stay up there at night to kind of watch the place. And I had lots of painting to do, and I went to bed. I didn't feel very good when I went to bed one night, and I... When I got up in the morning and looked in the looking glass, I couldn't believe it. My face was just puffed up, oh, just round as a moon. And uh, I went to the nurse. This was in the late fall, and the nurse was there. I went to the nurse, and she said, I've got to get you. She took my temperature, and she said, I've got to get you to the Panguage Hospital just as quick as I can. And so it wasn't only just a few minutes, but we was on our way to Panguage, and I had a car, and I believe she drove my car. Can't remember, but anyway, Dr. Mason was a doctor, and he took a, some tests in the blood. And he said, you've got infection about as high as I've ever seen in any person in my life. And he, gave me, he said, I'm giving you enough penicillin and biotics for 10 people. And he said, uh, how quick can you get ready? And I said, well, just, I've got to get my wife. And I, I, don't, I don't, or can't remember just all the circumstances. But anyway, Zorbell and I, the doctor, we headed for Provo. And he found a, a physician by the name of Dr. Clark, DeCosta Clark. And... Uh, they took x-rays, and I had two eye teeth right, growing crossways right under my eye, and I never had to cut these teeth in my life, and they finally got maturated, and infection was right close to my brain. Well, they strapped me down, tied my hands down, and uh, froze my face. I could still hear and I could still feel and the old doctor say, oh, I hate to do this. He had a rubber mallet. He pulled all my upper teeth. That was the first thing he done, every one on my upper jaw. And then he took a 
knife and cut my gums away from the bone and start to dig two trenches up through the bone structure on my upper jaw, up under my nose and side of my nose, cut two furrows up till he could get to those teeth. And every time he hit that mallet, I'm sure he had a razor sharp chisel, but it didn't make no difference. Any time he hit that mallet, it just went clear through me. My hands were just soaking wet with sweat, and my feet were just soaking wet. And uh, filled my mouth clear full of gauze, gauze after he got the death-killing teeth out and all the maturation cleaned out of the bone. Put some kind of a mesh or jello con concern in there to fill in so there wouldn't be too deep a, after it healed up, there wouldn't be too deep a groove, but there is too deep a groove even to this very day. And uh, sewed it all up, filled my mouth full of gauze and then tied my head up so I couldn't open my mouth. Called the hospital there and they didn't have a room for me, so Uncle Leo uh, and Elvin, Uncle Jim had a spare bedroom in the house, and we went there, Zora and I. The doctor says, I'll check on you at 9 o'clock, and a little after 9 he came, took the gauze out, and he was really flabbergasted. He said, I just thought you'd be hemorrhaging, thought you'd be bleeding. He said, you haven't hardly bled a bit, and he said, that's wonderful. Well, I healed up. But I lost one of the most precious things in my life. I lost my beautiful whistle. Oh, I never could thrill, and I never to this very day can equal the whistling I used to do then. But uh, I had to get false teeth and from my upper jaw, and that's been kind of a plague to me all my life from that time on. Uh, I had some very serious ailments in my life. I come down with the uh, polio way down in the, what they call the gravel hills. That's about 45 miles below tropic, maybe a little more. And I rode a horse back, tied to a horse all that miles out to tropic. Never had a doctor. I was completely paralyzed and my horse fell in the Perea Creek and submerged me under, and I was soaking wet, and I drove into the old town of Perea, and there's nobody there. There I was tied to that horse, and the horse went through the gate, uh, farm gate and up in the field, and fed all around, dark come, the stars come out, nobody to help me, and finally I heard a dog bark. That's the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life, or ever will hear, because I knew there's a man if there was a dog. An old man about 80 years old came, his name was Jack Seaton, and pulled me off my horse and fed me, and uh, Crash Shakespeare come in from the sheep herd and was going to Tropic, and he led my horse out with me tied to the saddle. I can remember when we left the old ghost town of Free, the old log cabin where I'd been sleeping that night, Jack Seaton had to feed me and press fed me from my breakfast. I couldn't feed myself because my hands and arms were paralyzed. And uh, Jack brought out a great big quart bottle full of homemade whiskey. Just begged me. He said, we're going up through that cold creek and up through all that cold water. This was in March. He said, you have to have some whiskey to keep you warm. And I said, no, I haven't ever drank it, and I just don't want any. And when we got out of the Pyre box about five miles below Tommy Richards Ranch or below ten miles below Cannonville, I pressed it out, speed my horse up, and I'll get a buggy and they'll come and get you, and I'll send somebody after you. But my horse was a very fast and when his horse got a, a head of ways, why she she kind of lengthened her stride out because she decided she's going home and I almost beat him home because his horse was very poor and give out. He just got slower and slower before he got home, and I almost beat him home. Frank Shakespeare and he, I mean Frank Alstrom and Frank Shakespeare and and uh, Glade and Dwayne Alstrom coming in, uh, tied me and took me off in the horse and packed me in and put me in, in the bed. And uh, time come when I had. My sister, Virginia, and Ireland would get their arms around my back, and I'd get my arms around their shoulders and neck, and they'd walk me, and, uh, and they'd pull my arms, and they'd pull my legs, and they'd uh, uh, went through the ritual of uh, what 
I was told to do by people. And uh, finally, I got about two months, I got some little prickles in the bottom of my feet. And from that time on, I got to a little bit better, and finally I got the feeling in my arms, and I could lay down on my belly and put by my elbows on the floor. I could pull myself to a chair and pull myself up and sit up to the table, and I'd crawl around on my belly. And finally, my legs got to where they'd hold up, and I could crawl, and finally I got to where I thought I could walk, but I couldn't, and my sisters, then they'd try to get me to walk, and my brain would say, you can walk, but I couldn't, and I had to learn to walk all over. And if you don't think that's not a hard job after you've walked all your life, then you can't, and you have to start over again. It's terrible. And uh, over in the East Valley, we heard the sheep one time, and uh, we had a big lucerne patch, and I was irrigating it, and we had a big pond full of water, and I didn't want too much water to come out the pond, so I pulled a lot of weeds and placed them right to the side of the ditch where I could put them in. And when dark came and I got the sheep on bed ground, I took my horse down and hobbled him out in the alfalfa and went up and picked this pile of uh, weeds up. And there was a rattlesnake in it. I picked him up and I had the shirt sleeves rolled up, thank goodness, and uh, had a tan shirt on. And uh, he bit me and uh, one fang went into the... the uh, fold on the rolled up shirt sleeves above my elbow and the other one went into the flesh. I could only see one fang mark when I got up to where I could get a light. The time I got up to my camp, which was, oh, I guess three quarters of a mile at least away, why my shirt, at, uh, my arm had swelled up till I couldn't pull my shirt up or down my arm. I had to take my knife out and cut my shirt sleeve off. I toughed it out till morning, and then I started for home. I trailed the sheep in the trail and and headed for home, and I got down in the lane east of Tropic, and I got so sick and so dizzy, I was crawling on my knees. Some Shakespeare boys was there, and they said, Who in the heavens is that drunk? Isn't he a drunk-looking wobble all over that road? He's really all pie-eyed. Well... Finally, they decided that something was wrong, so they come and got me, and I told them I'd been bitten by a rattlesnake, and they brought me home. Mother sent for Grandma Pollock, and she sent the kids into the hills to buy, to find uh, pickly pears, and she burnt the spines off, and then she peeled them, and then she just kept putting these uh, sticky pickly pears on that bite and began to draw the poison out, but I'd had the poison in my system for hours. But my arm fell... Uh, finally swelled up and just busted and looked like green lettuce when it busted the old green flesh in there. And uh, it took me for months to get over that. I healed up. And I remember one time Dad got really laughed and he said, what the devil is the matter, you son? Can't you help me? He's lifting on something. And I said, I, Dad, I haven't got a bit of strength. And I didn't. I would just didn't have a bit of strength. And then boils broke out all up and down my left side. Never had a boil on my right side, just on the left side where I'd been bit in the arm. And, oh, they was, they was mean boils. And, and uh, the last one I had was on the top of my finger, and I even had one right in my ear. Talk about supper. I never want to go through that again. And uh, little things like that. When I was out to the sheep herd, I'd come in and had the earache. Oh, March come, and I just couldn't stand it any longer. Grab, I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't go it all day long with the earache. And it, all at once, every once in a while, it'd be a buzz down in my ear and just sound like a thrashing machine was down in there. Well, I come home, and the lady folks around town, they all get her to help mother, and they look down in my ear, and they got her look a microphone, I make mean, a microscopic glass, and enlarging glass and looked down in there and they could see a tick, a wood tick down in the air. Every time he'd wiggle, he'd just send cold chills all over me and it just about deepened me right close to my eardrum, you know. And they put vinegar and they put turpentine and they put everything in the world down in to make that thing let loose and crawl out. And it couldn't do a thing and I just walked on the floor one morning and 
Old Grandma Lee, she's from the Deep South, and she's a convert to the church, and she heard, finally heard that I had a ticking mirror. Mother working in the Sunday school, and she had to go to Sunday school, and she took the kids and left Virginia to, to take care of me. In popped Grandma Lee. She had a little old uh, sack of just tall table salt. We used to buy salt in little white sacks, pound of salt. She had one of this, and she built up the kitchen fire in the old cook stove and pushed this salt in the oven and got it good and hot. She knew just how hot it had to be, and then she laid me down on the floor, and she put that salt right on top of my ear. It wasn't very long till I could feel that uh, wood trick of crawling out of my ear. I got up and holding a sack of salt, and I told Grandma Lee in Virginia, and she said, Virginia, now you get that tick when it comes out of his ear. When it crawled out, it was cream-colored. But Virginia, she got so excited, she, she dropped it, and it went down the shirt collar. Well, I took my clothes off, and we hunted, and finally found that tick and killed it. And, uh, oh, just, just some funny things like that happened to me when I was growing up. Uh, but ordinarily out on the range, I was real, real healthy. I was out on Jody Point one day, and and a rainstorm came up. I was about a mile and a half away, and I could see my tent. It was on a ridge right close by a cedar tree. All at once, I looked up, and a cedar tree was on fire. The lightning had struck it. Boy, did I make that horse run till I got to that tent. I just barely got there in time to save the tent. It was uh, fired, caught into some of the stuff, but uh, it hadn't got the tent, and so I didn't lose the tent in fire. I've had the wind blow my tent down. I remember Dad and Island uh, down the spring range was in the gravel hills where I come down to polio. Four o'clock in the morning, a tornado hit, and uh, you just picked that tent up like a bloom. Uh, you just see a black object going up and blotting the stars out, and it just went a sailing up. We found it the next morning several hundred yards away down in the hole. And uh, Dad said, grab a quilt. And so we each grabbed a quilt, and we run down the hillside in their underwear or this quilt, and then we rolled ourselves up in them quilt and stayed there till daylight. And, oh, we didn't have a time gathering up our camp. The tent was in bad shape. It didn't rip it up much. It just blew it up and packed it off a ways and dropped it. And we knew Sam Graff was not very far away if we'd seen him the night before, about two or three miles away, and we'd see sheep wagon. So we went out on the hillside and looked up a draw where he was supposed to be camped, and his wagon was laying over on its side. John Johnson's sheep wagon was laying over on its side. And <laughs> we had lots of experiences that way. I remember one time when I was a teenager down on the East Clark Bench and the hailstorm come up. Oh, it was a terrific hailstorm. An eight by ten tent, uh, about seven feet tall. It hailed so much hail, and the hail ran off in the tent and piled up down on the side, and I gathered it up the shovel and put it in the number three tub and melted it and watered six head of livestock and got two kegs of water out of just the hail that come off in the tent. And we decided that uh, after this terrible hailstorm, I'd better go to the old town and preach because there's enough hail and Dad wouldn't have to take the sheep to water. And the north side of the hills was all covered with hail, about two inches. So I did, and when I got to the mouth of East Clark Cove, there's a goat herd there, and Grant and Dick Shumway was herding these goats, and they had about 5,000 goats, and there was 1,800 goats dead. I never saw such a pile. They just piled and tromped one another and tried to get warm. They even come in his tent. He said he had to get the axe and kill some of them to keep them out of the tent, or they'd have, or they'd have froze to death with them. And it turned an awful cold. Another time, we could see that big old sandstorm coming, the clouds, red clouds of red sand was 
miles and miles high in the sky, coming from the southwest. We was in some heavy sand dunes. And we rounded the sheep up just before the dust got to us. And, and uh, this was in May. And uh, when the wind come, it just blew sand until it just cut your face and the little drops of blood had come out where the sand had hit you in the face. And I laid down on the ground and with my feet towards the wind and there's a big old dead yucca plant there. Oh, it was a big one. And we picked it out especially after we got the sheep rounded up and we, Dad set it on fire. And in this uh, yucca plant was a big old lizard that uh, Dad was watching the sheep and had his back to him in the wind. He had a pair of goggles. And, and uh, this lizard come out and my pants leg was the first place. Well, I felt this thing going up my leg and I could tell it was long. His tail was a wiggling back and forth and I just knew it was a snake. Dad said I come up like a jumping jack in spring and he said I was a dancing a darndest dance on one leg and screaming at the top of my voice. A snake went up my leg, a snake went up my leg. Well, he saw this lizard go up my leg. He knew it was a lizard. He's trying to tell me the snake, but I didn't hear what he said. I was too excited. Finally got me calmed down. He said, son, it's a lizard. But I'd grab that 